sometimes it's possible to sit and watch your breath. And it doesn't seem like much is happening. Breath is going in, breath is going out, you're aware. That seems to be about it. There was one time when the Buddha was recommending to the monks that they practice breath meditation, and one of the monks spoke up and said, Oh yeah, I'm already doing breath meditation. And the Buddha asked him, Well, what kind of breath meditation are you doing? And he said, Well, I put aside my hankering after the past and put aside my hankering after the future and just sit and try to be very equanimous in the present moment. And the Buddha said, there is that kind of breath meditation. But he said, it doesn't give great fruit or great benefit. So he took the opportunity to teach a type of breath meditation that did give great fruit and great benefit. And he went through 16 steps, which involve a lot of training. The first two steps simply say, notice when the breath is long and notice when it's short. But then beyond that, the Buddha gives you things to do. And each of these things to do is like a question. How do you do that? The first thing he says is try to be aware of the whole body as you breathe in and breathe out. Then as you do that, you begin to notice the effect that the breath has on the body whether it's comfortable or not. And so you try to calm that effect so it gives rise to a sense of pleasure and a sense of refreshment. That immediately alerts you, okay, there's something to be explored here. What kind of breath is really refreshing? How far can you push it? And sometimes you find that as you experiment with the breath, you make things worse, so you back off again and try another approach. So you might find that you're putting too much pressure on the breath. Okay, the next time when you experiment, you say, well, just try thinking, long breathing, short breathing, deep, shallow, and see how the body responds without your having to put any pressure on it at all. Or just pose the question, what kind of breathing would feel really good right now? And see how it responds. What you're doing is you're developing insight and tranquility at the same time. The tranquility comes from just staying with the breath. And the insight comes from seeing things in terms of what the Buddha calls fabrication. How does the body get fabricated by the breath? What kind of influence does the breath have on the body? Now, that's fairly quickly in the meditation he's having you look at things in terms of cause and effect, and particularly what, what's going to be comfortable, what's not comfortable. How would you rate breathing as comfortable or uncomfortable? Some types are obviously uncomfortable, but have you ever explored how really comfortable the breath can be? So you're trying to put these two qualities together, the stillness, the steadiness that you watch something. And you'll find that the steadier your gaze, the smoother the breath can be. Because if you're gaze is jumping around, then all these little gaps and irregularities can appear in the breath. But if you're watching continually, it's like spitting out a fine thread. It just keeps going and going and going and going and going, and it's all very continuous. Things get smoother. It doesn't have to be as jumpy as it sometimes can be. Then you start getting more sensitive to the various levels of pleasure and refreshment that can come from the breath. And you begin to notice how that pleasure and that refreshment can have an effect on the mind. This is another level of fabrication. 
It's called metal fabrication. And essentially, there are two things that have this kind of impact on the mind. One is the feeling of pleasure that you're trying to create and the variations in that level of pleasure. And then there are the perceptions. It's the mental labels you hold in the mind about your breath. When you breathe in, where do you think the breath comes in? What is the breath, anyhow? It's not just the air coming in and out of the lungs. It's an energy flow. So perceive it as that, an energy flow. And this energy flow can come in and out of the body anywhere. It can come down from the top of the head, in from the back of the neck, in in the middle of your back. Take a survey down your backbone. Where do things feel tight and out of balance? Think of the breath energy just coming in right there. Lots of energy. Full energy. Notice how that tense spot changes during the in-breath, how it changes during the out-breath. feels comfortable, stick with it. If it doesn't feel comfortable, try changing. How do you hold the back in such a way that the breath comes in, goes out, and is healing for that spot of tension, that spot of blockage? You can go anywhere in the body, anywhere where there's that feeling of the energy not moving well, and explore what would it be like for it to move well. What kind of perception do you have to hold in your mind in order to stay with it and explore the, the variations, the possibilities? They can come with the breath. They can come with the different ways you fabricate your state of mind through feeling and perception. Again, you're doing two things at once. You're getting the mind still because it's interested. You're not having to force it to stay here. But there's something to explore. And you're exploring particularly the issue of fabrication, which is precisely what insight is all about. How does the mind fabricate things? How does the breath fabricate your sense of the body? How do feelings and perceptions fabricate your mind? How does the way you direct your thoughts and the way you evaluate things, how does that affect the mind, too? Because that's another kind of fabrication. They're all right here. It's not that nothing is going on. It's just that we got so used to get the way things are going on that we don't really notice it. It's like living in a city and you turn on the tap and there's water. You turn on the switch and there's electricity. You turn on the heat and there's heat. And you hardly give it any thought. Nothing's happening. But then if you start exploring, exactly how does water get to your tap in the city? Where does it come from? What processes does it go through? How does electricity get to where you are? What's the source of the heat in your building? start thinking about these things, and you realize there are a lot of people working just to keep things going as if nothing were happening. Well, it's the same in the body. There's a lot of fabrication going on. The breath fabricating, the way you sense your body, what they call proprioception, your sense of the body as you feel it from within. You're sitting here, you know where your hand is. You know where there's tension in the different parts of the body. That's different from the sense of touch. It's your internal sense of the body. One of the texts they call your sense of form. And how do you create pleasure there? The Buddha gives you ways of analyzing. He says there's the warmth, there the liquid sensations, the breath sensations, the solid sensations. And when things seem out of balance, what's wrong? Is it too warm? Is there too much breath energy? Is there too little breath energy? Are things feeling too heavy? 
And what happens if you use the perception of extra warmth? There is warmth in different parts of your body. If you're feeling cold, find the warmth and see if you can maximize it. Or if the breath isn't flowing well, what can you do to straighten that out, to kind of comb out all the tangles in the breath energy? And you begin to see there's a lot going on here. And this is precisely what the Buddha has you look at, fabrication. This is where insights are going to arise. And where do they arise? They arise right here. And as you get to know this process of fabrication really distinctly and really subtly, then you begin to realize how the mind fabricates other things as well, particularly your emotions. Because emotions are made out of these same things. That's the way the energy flows in your body when you're angry, as opposed to the way it flows when you're feeling lust or how it flows when you're feeling fear. And there are the thoughts that contribute to that particular emotion. The way you evaluate the situation around you, that's contributing to your emotion. And the feelings and perceptions, they're all there, creating this emotion that you've got going. And again, it seems like it just all happens on its own. But once you get more sensitive to the processes, you can begin to see how much you're adding to the situation that you don't really have to add, it's particularly how much stress, how much emotional pain, and sometimes physical discomfort that you're creating around this emotion. And you can ask yourself, is it worth it? Is this actually helping me or is it getting in the way? The body may be wired to fight, but is this a good time to fight, say? It may be wired to run away. Is this a good time to run away? It may be wired to feel lustful about things, but is this a good time to feel lust? And if you haven't been paying attention, you don't, have, don't know how to undo these unskillful emotions. But if you get sensitive to the fact that, okay, the breath is a contributing factor here, at the very least you can breathe in a way that releases a lot of the tension that's in the body around the fear or the lust or the anger. So you don't have that physical sense of something in your system, you've got to get it out. Because you can dissolve it out. Relax your hands, relax your fingers, relax the backs of your hands, relax your feet. Kind of open up those channels. And as some of those physical symptoms go away, it's a lot easier to look at the situation and have a more balanced view of what's actually going on and what would be a skillful thing to say, as opposed to what you just feel like saying. What would be the skillful thing to do? Is this the right time to act, or is it not? This is why the Buddha recommends that you learn how to practice concentration as an important part of the path. Because it helps you to see things, partly just in the sense of getting the mind to settle down and create a sense of ease and refreshment with the breath. You've got to experiment, you've got to ask questions, and you learn about these processes. And then as the mind is still, when there's a slight bit of disturbance, you sense it quickly. I was reading the other day someone complaining that They'd read a piece where someone had said that it's important to have strong concentration in your practice. And this person said, well, no, my teacher taught, you that, taught me that strong concentration is delusional because you don't see your defilements. You have to spark your defilements. You have to stir up your defilements to see them. Well, you'll see them, but will you understand them? By learning how to take them apart, tease out all the different threads that go into this weaving of a feeling of anger, a weaving of a feeling of lust, a weaving of a feeling of fear. If you can tease them out, then you can unravel these things. You don't have to be under their power. You're more sensitive. 
So it's a combination of understanding that comes from learning how to get the mind under control and have a sense of real rapture and refreshment here. The Buddha didn't say, just sit here and watch whatever comes up without giving you a foundation for watching. The foundation comes from that sense of well-being that comes from knowing how to deal with the breath, knowing how to deal with the perceptions and feelings, the thoughts and the way you evaluate that go up, that go into creating a pleasurable state of both physical and mental well-being. So that when that well-being is disturbed, you sense it quickly and have some idea of where it came from and how you can unravel that disturbance. And then learning how to do this continually, making this part of your everyday way of negotiating with the world. As you walk down the street, be sensitive to the breath. Learn how to watch your perceptions. Notice what there is in the street that pulls you out. Now, it's easier to see this if you're walking down the street with that sense of fullness. Can you maintain it while you're walking? This is one of the reasons we do walking meditation, is to keep that sense of fullness, refreshment, pleasure going, no matter what we do. Try to develop a sense of a steady center. This is where the teachings on heedfulness come in, because the defilements that can make a mess of your life can come at any time. You may think, well, I've learned how to deal with that defilement. Well, it's, you've dealt with it once, but that doesn't mean you're going to be able to deal with it the same way the next time. Defilements have their tricks. And so you, you learn one way of dealing with it, and it comes back again, and you try the old way, and dealing with it doesn't work this time. You say, okay, there's something new to learn here. That's one thing to remember. And the other is just, of course, that there are lapses in mindfulness. You get complacent, and whoops, there it comes. You forgot. Or it can come armed with teeth, saying, look, you've been dealing with me all this time, and I'm still not going away. I'm invincible. You'll never beat me. Well, no, that's not the case at all. Just look at that. That's another perception, and it's a very diff it's a very unskillful perception. That here's a perception that's coming along, coming out of who knows where. Because you have to remember, the mind is like a committee. Some members of the committee like to meditate, other members of the committee like to do other things. Every member of the committee has his or her own favorite pleasure. And so you have to ferret that out as well, because sometimes there are a lot of states of mind you have that you don't like, and you identify yourself with the not liking, yet somehow there's something in there that does like it. You've got to ask yourself, okay, what is there? What's the pleasure that comes from this? What am I feeding on when I fall for this state? And it's a lot easier to see the feeding habits of the mind, especially the unskillful feeding habits, when you learn how to feed in a more skillful way. When you have a sense of accomplishment, when you have a sense of confidence that comes from learning how to deal with the mind, get it to be still, at least sometimes. You know, at least sometimes you can do this. Well, we've done it in the past, let's do it again. And realize you're up against a lot of committee members. So it may take some time to ferret out all the different ones and all the different tricks that they play. But they all come down to these three types of fabrication. There's the physical fabrication of the breath energy. There's the verbal fabrication of how you direct your thoughts and evaluate things, decide what's good, what's bad, what, what's working, what's not working. And then your perceptions and, and feelings. Feelings here mean, meaning feeling tones of pleasure or pain, or neither pleasure nor pain. 
These are the elements that create states of states of mind that inhabit both the body and the mind. And you keep remembering, reminding yourself, okay, it's just these th these three types of fabrication. So this is how concentration helps you gain insight into the mind. First in the process of getting the mind to have a sense of well-being and fullness and stability in the present. Learning about these factors and then learning how to see how they go into the construction of your different defilements. So you can pull them apart, tease out the threads. And particularly when these traitorous perceptions come in, you learn to recognize, well, that's just a perception. Don't have to allow it to give power over my decisions and counteract it with other perceptions. And then get the breath on your side, get the feeling tone of well-being on your side. And at the very least, you find you can stand firm against that particular defilement. And it's even better when you begin to see, oh, here's another, another threat that you missed the last time. Or here's another one. So there's actually plenty going on. It's just learning how to analyze it, and learning how to master these processes so you can get them on your side on the side of wanting to develop a path that leads to the end of suffering. Rather than just muddling around in your old ways of creating more and more suffering and stress and complaining about it, but not really being able to do anything about it, because you don't understand the, the underlying factors. But that's what this path is all about, is to give you the strength and the precision of vision, so you can learn how to withstand the unskillful ones and develop the skillful ones in their place. It's all happening right here. It's simply a matter of learning, learning how to look. If you look from the wrong angle, you wouldn't see anything at all. If you look from the right angle, it's all thrown into relief.